you'll be turning in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll read in just a moment our scripture from that blessed book. Today we celebrate Easter, the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious, obedient Son who went to the cross on Friday for our sins and has this day we celebrate been raised to the right hand indeed eventually of the Father. He has broken the gates of death and hell. He has taken the victory from death. Sometimes we treat the crucifixion and the resurrection as 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 one event and there is much truth in that that they are eternally linked as the work of our salvation but i want us to remember as we come to a resurrection passage today i want us to remember that it is on the cross that our sins are paid for that the blood of christ is shed for the remission of sins that there on the cross that two-way transfer that we talk about so often here, right? Our sins go to Christ. Christ's righteousness is credited to our account so that we wear it, not that we become righteous in and of ourselves, but we wear it like a garment. When God looks at us, He sees Christ's righteousness because He sees you clothed in that righteousness. It is on the cross where God turns His back on His Son. It is at the cross that the wrath of God is poured out onto Christ. The payment for your sins and the payment for mine. He who knew no sin became sin for you because God loved you that much. Prepared even before the foundations of the world. But it is at the resurrection where we find the confirmation of all of Christ's work on the cross. It is the seal of this obedient work of a life well lived, a life perfectly lived, and a death, an atoning death that is done for you and for me. And it is at the cross that the death pays the penalty, but it is at the resurrection that we are sealed into our eternal life. And our passage today in 1 Peter tells us of two great gifts that we are given through the resurrection. And it is to this passage that I want us to look today. We find the first gift, our living hope, and what a blessed gift that in is in and of itself. But the other gift that we get is called by F.W. Borum a deathless heritage. I love that phrase for it symbolizes all that we will see this morning. We stand each week in reverence for God's word as they did in the days of Ezra. So please stand with me. As we read this morning, as I read these few verses in 1 Peter chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming <clears throat> of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and hearing of this, your most holy word. But we pray that we would see no man save Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated.
As we come to this fabulous passage this morning, the first thing that I want you to notice, if you want to follow along in your own Bibles this morning, as we celebrate the Resurrection <clears throat> Sunday, that we are given this gift, we are given this by the mercy of God. The endless mercy of God. Annie Johnston Flint's great hymn, right? He giveth more grace. When we have reached the end of our hoarded stores, she writes, His giving is just beginning. His mercy is unending, and it is out of that mercy that we are given this. We are shown God's love, His mercy, in the cross. Now, so often we glorify the cross, this thing that is an instrument of death, and yet it sits here in the front of our sanctuary. There is... There's a cross here to remind us, not only that Jesus is no longer there, but that it is at the cross where God's love and mercy is shown in its greatest form. This instrument of suffering and death is by and of itself the glorious revelation of God's love to you and to me. And it is from the cross to the resurrection that we are sealed into a great redemption in Jesus Christ. We spoke the other night about this fact that there are two gifts that we get in the cross and in the resurrection. That is Christ's gift to us as Savior. But hear me when I say this. You are a gift God gives to His Son. You are the covenant people God has called as a love gift to His Son. A gift that Peter is writing about here. He's writing to poor, suffering Christians who have lost their status because they've moved from Judaism to Christianity, or perhaps they're being persecuted by the Romans as well, and, and, and they are struggling. And, and here he wants to remind them that they have a, a new birth, a new birth in Jesus Christ. So the, the, the first question that I would ask all of you here this morning is, are you born again? Do you have this new birth? Do you have this personal vivacious life with Christ. This meaningful relationship. Not just head knowledge. Not just your parents or your grandparents' church. Not just that you signed a card or walked the aisle, but a personal living relationship with a Savior. Do you have that? Because if you do not have that, I am here to tell you this morning, you are not saved. You are not saved. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and is living and wants to have a living relationship with you. A personal relationship. And part of that new birth, Peter says, comes to us in two things or two parts that are given to us, and we rejoice this Easter Sabbath because we have these two things. The first thing is a living hope. He says that in His great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ died on the cross to pay for sins. His death, that atoning death that I spoke of earlier, is the perfect sacrifice. Once and done, never in the shadow of the Old Testament does it have to be repeated as the Old Testament sacrifices did. But this is a once for all, for all time, not to be repeated. But he does not stay dead, does he? No, the stone is rolled away. 
The body is not there. Why do you look for the living among the, the dead, amongst the living? Christ has been raised. He is a living hope. The entire epistle, as I mentioned earlier, is about hope. It revolves around hope. If you study the book of First Peter in its entirety... But hope, in terms of the Bible itself, is not just wishful thinking. It is not these trying to conjure up some kind of confident feeling in an anxious world. No, from a biblical standpoint, hope is a certain confidence. Certain confidence. In a fact. Now, do we have the fullness of our salvation here in this life? Absolutely not. But are we living in our true eternal life now? Absolutely. It may not seem like that some days. You may not feel like that on other days. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are living in that confident hope of eternal life. Our living hope is that Christ who has died is raised again. He is the permanency of our hope. He will never again be subject to death. He is forever. And you see the great thing about being confident in this living hope it is it is not that we have confidence in a cause or in a thing, but we have confidence in a person. And that person is Jesus Christ, our Savior. So Christians should never, indeed can never, be hopeless. That is, think about that for a second. You can never be hopeless. You may have emotional roller coasters. You may have days when you feel one way or days when you feel another, but you cannot be hopeless because your Savior lives. You have a perfect Savior. Our hope is dynamic. It is vital. Our hope is living because it lives in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as I come and meditate on this passage, that overwhelms me so much. But Peter isn't finished yet. He says, look, not only do you have a living hope, but there's more. And he goes on to detail that here. He says, look, you have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept for you in heaven. You are given a glorious inheritance, a deathless heritage. As adopted sons and daughters of the King, co-heirs with Christ, you have every right and ownership and all that the Son has in a marvelous inheritance with Him. And this passage gives us Three aspects of that inheritance. They're all, interestingly enough, told in the negative form. And I want to briefly touch on these three this morning. The first one is that our inheritance will never perish. Our inheritance will never perish. Another way to say this is that our inheritance is incorruptible incorruptible when you think about corruption all forms of corruption go from better to worse right things decline things age and yet as Paul writes in Romans 1 our God is incorruptible he is eternal he can never perish and so our inheritance is incorruptible as well 
Our inheritance is flawless. It is incapable even of developing a flaw. That is your inheritance, my dear friends, today. That inheritance in Jesus Christ. We have this, this, this incorruptible, glorious inheritance. It is the same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians where he says that we will be raised from corruptible bodies to incorruptible bodies, flawless bodies. All right, some of us look forward to flawless bodies more than others, perhaps. But we nonetheless, like our inheritance, will be raised in incorruption. And our inheritance that waits us will never perish. But there's more. It'll never spoil, he says. He says it will last forever. That Another way of saying it is that our inheritance is undefilable. The defilement of this world is what? It's sin, right? Defiles our own hearts. It defiles all of God's creation. Creation itself fell when Adam and Eve fell as well. And yet our inheritance will never spoil. We bought this, this contraption at one of the kitchen stores, right, that you're supposed to hang your bananas on. And I thought it was like the eternal inheritance of our salvation. They weren't ever supposed to go bad, right? But I looked this this morning as I got ready to uh, eat some breakfast, and um, our bananas had spoiled your inheritance is not like that it will never turn brown it will never go soft it never spoils thirdly it will never fade it will never fade he says you have an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade that is, you have an inheritance that will never lose its vigor, its beauty, its freshness. When I wrote that line, its freshness, I had to pause for a minute. For many of us who have walked with the Lord a long time, tend often to let loose of the sight of the freshness of our salvation. God's mercies are new every morning. And yet we sometimes treat our salvation, our inheritance as, oh yeah, been there, done that, I got that t-shirt. Ladies and gentlemen, you have an inheritance that will never fade away was reminded of this very fact this week as we all watched in horror as the Notre Dame Cathedral burned almost to the ground. This building that had lasted for 900 years, gone in a matter of hours, most of it, some of it. How quickly things can fade away. How quickly memories fade. How quickly objects of our pursuit, our, our idols that we want to grab hold of, how soon they fade. Not so. Not so with our salvation. This mighty cathedral with its wonderful flying buttresses and its magnificent Gothic architecture, the fire illuminating the entire city, as much of that, that wood burned away. The grass withers, but the Word of God stands forever. Your inheritance and mine will not fade. The famed biblical uh, illustrator, Gustave Doré, whose masterpieces 
illuminate so many glorious books and, and Bibles. Doré, in his early work as an artist, mixed his paints with an agent that was corrupt. And so many of his earliest works have now faded into oblivion. And I thought as I read about that and have studied his work over many, many years, when we mix earthly things with our inheritance, they do spoil and perish and fade, don't they? My dear people, if you love Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the eternal inheritance that, you, that awaits you will never fade, it will never spoil, it will never perish. I'm reminded that um, so often if you watch any TV at all, uh, at some point in time, a commercial comes on telling you that no matter what you've done, you don't have enough money for retirement, right? They play these out in a thousand different games and ways where people all of a sudden discover that their thing that they depend on in inheritance, which is their bank account, may not be adequate. Your inheritance, my dear friends, is completely adequate and it will last you for all eternity praise Jesus Christ for that your inheritance is not subject to economic swings your inheritance is not subject to political intrigue your inheritance is not subject to war or famine your inheritance is secure in heaven for you. And it is your faith in your Savior that shields you, that protects you until you meet your Savior face to face. Bunyan. It's hard to preach an Easter sermon without going back to Bunyan. Bunyan in his great works, work Pilgrim's Progress, if you were with us for our study of that, you know this story, that there in the beginning, Christian sets out on his pilgrimage from the city of destruction to the celestial city, and he bears his burden on his back, and he carries a book in his hand, and as he leaves the city of destruction and heads out towards the wicked gate, two neighbors from the city of destruction try to come out and persuade him to try and, and, and convince him to turn back to return with them to the city of destruction. Pliable and obstinate are their names. And they go out and they begin to talk with Christian and, and to, to try to convince him that his harebrained idea of leaving the city of destruction for a better life, to rid himself of his burden, is a futile one. And if you remember the glorious words of Christian, as he begins to interact with pliable and obstinate, he begins to... to, to, to tell them of this glorious hope that he is pursuing. His mind is, is made up. He has his face set towards finding the way. And he talks about this glorious hope that he has found. And finally, Obstinate says to him, but what are these things that you're seeking? 
What are you trying to find that you are willing to forsake everything? And Christian turns to him and says, I seek an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for those who are diligently seeking it. Here, read it in my book for yourself. Quotes 1 Peter 1, 3 here. Now, his homely little evangelism turns off obstinance, if you know the story, and he goes back to the city of destruction uh, with great um, anger in his heart. So I ask on this Resurrection Sunday, all of you, do you have this living hope in you? Do you realize it? Does it, does it command your being? Does it command how you see life? Does it make the lens in which you look at the rest of the world? Does it guide the idols of your heart into submission to the great Savior? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? For obstinance, he went back right away. Pliable, however, continued, if you know the story, with Christian until they got to the sloth of despond, where they fell into the muck. And life began to get hard. And Pliable, Bunyan writes so beautifully, got out of the sloth on the side nearest the city of destruction. And he returned home. So the point of all that this morning is simply this. Do you value the inheritance that Jesus Christ presents to you? Do you hold on to the living hope that is your Savior? He is raised. The cross is not adorned with black. It is adorned with flowers this day. He is not there. He is risen. Our living hope. May He draw you to Himself and sustain you all of these days. May you revel in the inheritance that you possess that will never perish, it will never spoil, it will never fade because your inheritance rests in the living hope who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.